Good evening. My name is Stacey Lazat, the DMA League Director of Adult Programs here at the museum, and I want to welcome you to tonight's program. This talk is the second in a three-part series highlighting the conservation work done on objects featured in three of our fall exhibitions. Tonight we're going to learn more about our new exhibition that's in the Barrel Vault, Slip Zone, a new look at post-war abstraction in the Americas and East Asia, and it's going to be on view until next summer, so if you have not seen it, there's plenty of time, and we encourage you to explore that show multiple times. And I have the privilege of introducing our three speakers for tonight's talk. First is Laura Eva Hartman, the painting conservator here at the DMA. Laura joined the DMA in October of 2015 to work us alongside Mark Leonard in establishing the Paintings Conservation Department. Notable projects include contributions to the Van Gogh and the Olive Groves catalog, and the exhibition that's going to open here next month. And another significant treatments for works in the DMA's collection, including Jackson Pollock's Cathedral and Rufio Tamayo's Nude, just to name a few. Next, we'll have Elena Torek, the Associate Objects Conservator here at the museum. And she works on the treatment, research, and long-term care of objects in the collection. And since 2017, she has worked with an interdepartmental team to develop and implement collection care plans for time-based media artworks here at the museum. And then our third speaker is Lance Lander. He's the manager of gallery technology and innovation. During his 17 years here at the museum, he has managed the installation of all time-based media, and he designs, installs, and maintains all technological components that you'll find in both our exhibitions and our galleries. He also works with the conservation department to properly care and store the DMA's media-based artworks. Some of his noteworthy installations include Phil Collins, The World Won't Listen, Take Your Time, Olafur Eliasson, The Fashion World of Jean-Paul Gaultier, and most recently, For a Dreamer of Houses. But now, please join me in welcoming Laura Hartman to the stage, who will begin the presentation. Thank you so much, Stacey. It's always such a kind introduction. And thank you all for coming. I heard there's a terrible storm brewing. So thank you for, um, for making it out this way. Um, so this is the second in a three-part series featuring various recent conservation projects at the Dallas Museum of Art. And I get asked a lot how we prioritize projects. And oftentimes, projects are pushed forward based on upcoming exhibitions and loans. So we wanted to give you a behind-the-scenes look at some of the recent projects that we undertook for, uh, in preparation for Slip Zone. We worked on many projects to prepare for this beautiful exhibition. Some shown here uh, on the screen, such as this amazing Ed Clark which required stretching um, a painting that was much bigger than any one of us. And this is our tallest prep bin, so to, to show you scale. <clears throat> and it's important to note that projects are never done in a vacuum, and we work very closely with many wonderful colleagues, including our preparator and registrar friend. And this evening, I'm excited to share a deep dive into one of these projects, and then my colleagues Elena and Lance will share their work on a time-based media work of art. <clears throat> so I showed a couple of these slides during the last talk in the series, but I wanted to make sure you all know that the DMA Paintings Lab is actually um, visible, is a visible conservation space, which means you can all peek through the glass and get a, and get a good glimpse at what we're doing at any given time, so come on your next visit. And fundamental to building the studio, uh, now over seven years ago, probably longer, um, and establishing the formal paintings conservation program at the museum was creating an open space for treatment and research, so that perfect mix of art and science. Conservators are stewards of art, and we work towards the long-term preservation of cultural heritage. In doing so, we are guided by ethical guidelines instituted by our professional organizations in the United States, primarily the American Institute for Conservation, or AIC. And fundamental guiding ethics include that we aim to be minimally interventive, 
So we choose the less interventive path for each treatment step as is possible, such as choosing to retouch a tiny loss as opposed to repaint, as opposed to repainting a whole work of art. And I showed this last time, but um, it's a viral example of kind of what not to do. We also use appropriate and reversible materials and techniques, and we fully document the process. So with that foundation in mind, last year, the Dallas Museum of Art was awarded a grant from the Getty Foundation to participate in the Conserving Canvas Initiative. This initiative was focused on expanding mentorship programs to train generations to come in specialized conservation techniques in which training might not be widely available, hybrid hair mending being one such technique. Therefore, the premise of our project was to advance training in hybrid tear mending and continue sharing and developing this technique with colleagues near and far as tear mending and structural treatment are a particular interest of mine. Underlying the project was the treatment of this powerful work by Bolivian painter Maria Luisa Pacheco titled Stoic Figure, painted in 1959. The summer previous um, I guess, to the project a year ago. COVID, COVID makes time not make sense. Um, in preparation for the reinstallation of the Latin American permanent galleries at the museum, this painting emerged from storage, having arrived at the DMA already damaged in 1959, um, actually on its way to the museum for that exhibition, and therefore it was never exhibited. The damage that occurred resulted in a large tear. Apart from allowing us to finally exhibit this great work, treatment of the damage presented the opportunity to develop and train in mending techniques specifically related to modern and contemporary paintings. Pacheco was an influential painter and mixed media artist born, uh, born in La Paz and immigrating to New York City in 1956. Her early work is indicative of the indigenism style of contemporary Bolivian painters with an edge in more abstract experimentation. Her later career is marked by a shift towards texture in her paintings, likely influenced by Cubist artists such as George Brock and Huang Gri. Her paintings, however, continued consistently to show an underlying indigenous inspiration rem reminiscent of her Andean culture, which is exemplified by the painting at hand. Reflecting on her art, Maria Toral, a contemporary Chilean artist, commented that you can feel the transparency of the air in Bolivia in her art and her constant authenticity. Images of the landscape in La Paz and especially mountainous views such as this show clearly the influence of her country and land had on her work. And texture and surface in her paintings are so important that fundamental to this treatment was preserving those features. And here are some raking light images showing the beautiful texture found throughout Stoic figure. The work apart from the terror was in almost pristine condition, likely from remaining untouched in museum storage for all of these years. The terror was also a perfect candidate for localized tear mending techniques. Hybrid or modified hybrid techniques are a particular type of structural treatment that um, I prefer in-house here at the DMA for tear mending. Hybrid tear mending is a beautiful technique. The goal is minimal intervention and to bring the area as close to its original state prior to the damage. This means not only re-establishing the weave structure and tension, but also using materi materials that will react similarly to the original. Professor Winfried Hyber originated the technique he was a brilliant conservator and a generous colleague. His paper in Alternatives to Lining is a fabulous introduction to thread by thread tear mending if you're interested in taking a deeper dive. <clears throat> Christina Young's essay in the same publication is also fabulous. The illustration here shows the type of thread joints you might encounter during mending, explaining generally that the goal of the technique is to reintroduce tension to the mended area, distributing stress evenly at the mend. In the past, other options could have included and are still used at times, um, tear or uh, patching a tear or lining the entire canvas. 
However, as suggested by the name, this technique entails reweaving each thread of a tear back together using adhesive as needed to introduce tension back to the area in a way truly reversing the damage as opposed to just fixing it. <clears throat> the tools used for tear mending are generally pretty DIY. Um, here you see the general setup of finely tweaked scissors, dental tools, tweezers, needles, and weights. We don't really have an industry that makes uh, any specific tools for us necessarily, or at least at any wide um, production. And it seems pretty abstract, but I hope these images will show you that um, using these tiny tools under the microscope, you can treat tears locally, one thread at a time, reintegrating tension, and allowing the repair of tears without patches or lining. Um, and oh. And uh, Hyber's preferred adhesive was a mixture of sturgeon glue and wheat starch paste. And here you see a tear mend I did using the technique and preferred adhesive. So here you see um, before mending and after mending. And you can see that it's also really nice because all of the little paint flakes are still there. Um, when threads are missing, they can be replaced with new threads, having the same thickness and stiffness like here. And no humidification is used prior to the mend, but magically as you work, the canvas returns to planarity. Here you see after tear mending and adding a fill material to areas of loss and after treatment. And in raking light, it is particularly striking how the tear really disappears and the tension is regained in the area. Aside from the structural benefit of this technique is the aesthetic one, and that the tear is nearly invisible from the reverse after treatment as well, like here. And these photomicrographs of the tear show how the men comes together, and even a heavily distorted area like this can be brought back. This invisibility is especially important when the canvas has important features that need to be preserved, such as canvas stamps, like this large tear in which the painting was able to remain unlined and canvas stamp fully visible post-treatment. Conservators work, uh, so conservation work is done on a case-by-case -case basis, as I mentioned earlier, um, analyzing and modifying treatment to the specific needs of an object. So for each tear, you have to start by looking closely and choosing your technique and adhesive, for example, to suit the specific needs of the object in front of you. Here, here are a range of different types of tears you might come across um, to show you that there's so much variation and why you really have to consider each tear individually. So some tears are more jagged and torn and some are straight across um, or diagonal to the weft and weave. Um, so a good starting point place when analyzing a tear is to identify what is the physical nature of the tear. How did it happen? Uh, was the painting cut with a knife? Was it, um, did it kind of fall and then the fibers split? And this will guide your adhesive selection with the goal always being controlled reversibility. And here's some examples of tears and adhesives uh, chosen specifically for the type of tear just to give you a sense um, of the differences. So. In a situation like this where the fibers are kind of wild, you might want to choose something like wheat starch paste, um, sturgeon glue mixture because it does have a lot of flexibility, it's easily reversible, but it's not the best adhesive perhaps for a straight tear um, because it can be a little more brittle. And in that situation, you might want to pick something um, that fills the gaps and kind of holds it together a little bit better. Um, as adhesive choices and techniques are always evolving and being improved by practitioners, our project began with a meeting of minds, and we held an expert term, uh, and we held a panel here at the DMA pre-COVID um, with expert tear menders, including Caroline Tomkovitz, Petra Demuth, and Robert Proctor, uh, to discuss personal tear mending practice, the use of techniques and tools advances made through experience, and directions for future research. 
Um, and we were supposed to have a part two, but hopefully we'll be able to have one uh, when we're able to travel more widely. And my um, participant at the time, Luciana Fels, shown here, um, was then able to take all of that information and develop her own hand through, uh, at tear mending throughout the project. So Luciana joined the studio to work with me on this project over the course um, of six months. This was her first time working with the hybrid tear mending technique and she did an amazing job. Um, the tear shown here was vertical and measured over six and a half inches in length. And I should say another part of Luciana's um, fellowship was that she's from Argentina and she actually is working right now on translating a lot of her tear mending experience into Spanish language, uh, which is fabulous and why this project was so fitting. Um, but then COVID. Um, so you can see the tear here from the back. It's pretty extreme and um, especially at the bottom has a, quite a bulge. And in raking light, you can see that extreme deformation. Um, the other challenging part of a tear like this is that it's actually been torn since 1959. So it's really um, kind of stubborn in, in the situation it's in now. So Luciana began practice on mock-ups before commencing work on the Pacheco. And she is seen here working diligently under the microscope. Uh, so during the chair embedding pro uh, process, you actually work under the microscope and you work from front to back. So we made these, what we call collars, which you attach to the sides of the painting. So you can actually flip the painting pretty easily while still having room underneath to work. And this is the typical view from the microscope, working with weights to hold things in place as you mend. And I don't think she believed that the tear would come back together, but it really is just one thread at a time, patiently reweaving. Uh, the first step in any tear mend is deciding where to start, um, but also kind of organizing everything. So you can see uh, she's using these longer threads to, to kind of organize and count all the horizontal fibers um, it's kind of a mess in the middle, so she she had to come up with systems of cataloging how many threads were there, how many threads were missing, how many she had to replace. Um, so you really have to take an inventory and start organizing everything. Uh, but as you start mending, and these are your photomicrographs taken under the microscope, you see how it slowly starts coming together. And it always looks a little chaotic at first when the mend starts, but when it does start to come together, it's so satisfying. So it really looks like a mess over here, but slowly it starts taking shape. <clears throat> and here you see that very distorted area at the end before and during treatment. So just before um, treatment was finished and from the front before and after tear mending overall. And the lighter areas are where newer threads, like I showed earlier, were used um, to replace threads that were completely missing. And the distortion was beautifully mitigated through careful humidification of individual threads and pulling tension back together to the area during the tear mending process. Luciana also developed models for fill materials um, and application techniques that would imitate the texture of the original paint but she unfortunately had to leave before retouching could be complete. So um, as soon as I was able to get back in the studio, I finished the filling and retouching in time for the slip sewn install. So you see the tear here before and after treatment, or hopefully you don't see it. And again, um, the, and from the reverse. And the beauty of this technique is that you're addressing the tear, reversing the damage, and not just patching the area. So you're really creating a truly seamless repair. And here's the work before and after treatment overall. And in raking light, you can see the texture and planarity achieved. So this is raking light, where you literally just rake a light across the surface of a work of art. 
I am so proud of Luciana for her great work, and our curatorial colleagues were thrilled to be able to exhibit the work for the very first time since 1959. And I am so grateful to all of my colleagues who participated and facilitated this project and beyond, and want to acknowledge, especially my colleagues um, mentioned on this slide. And thank you all for your attention, and I will now pass it on to Elena and Lance, and we'll join them for a Q&A after their part of the talk. Um, thank you, Laura, and thanks again to everybody for coming out this evening. Um, it's great to see so many people here. Um, Lance and I are going to spend the next 10 minutes or so sharing the work we did this summer on Atsuko Tanaka's work, Bell, um, in preparation for the Slip Zone exhibition. So this piece, uh, made from 12 bells, wire, a motor, and a switch, was first made by Tanaka in 1955 and exhibited that same year at the first Gutai Art Exhibition. Uh, the original no longer exists, but the artist recreated five versions of this piece during her lifetime, um, and the DMA co-owns this one with the Rachowski collection. So the work is interactive, um, so the viewer's involvement is an integral part of it. Um, I, just by show of hands, how many of you have seen this already in the Slip Zone exhibition? Okay, good, a good amount of you. So you've heard how loud it is. Um, and um, so when the, when the push button switch, which is located in this image just on top of the pedestal, um, is pushed, the bells play very loudly in a predetermined order and sound travels around the room and through the gallery. So in Slip Zone, the physical components of this piece are installed along the floor around the perimeter of the Stoffel Quad um, and then out into the main area of the Barrel Vault. So this part of the exhibition is curated by our colleague Vivian Lee, who's the Lupe Murchison Curator of Contemporary Art and uh, titled Destroy the Paintbrush. And this gallery features numerous other artworks, both from and inspired by the Japanese-based Gutai art movement of the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. Um, so here you can see works by uh, Kazuo Sh Shiraga, Shozo Shimamoto, and Jackson Pollock, um, all in the same area. So artists who were part of the Gutai Art Association experimented with both performance and creative process as part of their work. So the, the artwork is more about the process rather than the end result. Um, and interestingly, Tanaka actually uh, referred to this work, uh, at, re referred to Bell as a painting, um, a painting of sound. So, but for the purposes of preservation, we consider this work to be part of our time-based media collection. Um, so time-based media art, uh, which we define as artworks that involve some kind of duration, um, can include video, software, audio, slides, film, performance-based art, um, as well as electronic media and installations. Um, and the material nature of these types of works can make them really challenging sometimes to both display and preserve in the long term. Um, so because of this, the DMA takes a team-based approach to their acquisition, their exhibition, and their long-term care. Um, our, our internal time-based media art working group includes members from six different departments, um, and Lance and I represent two of those. So uh, Lance is in exhibitions, and I work in conservation. Um, and we all work together to talk about and address the challenges that commonly come up with these types of, of materials. Uh, the DMA has approximately 75 time-based media artworks in its collection, and as it has grown, so have the responsibilities of our team. Um, so some of the artworks might only be a few seconds long, like this James Coleman video installation, which includes just a very quick scene on an amusement ride that loops over and over again. Um, and others may play for an infinite amount of time, like John Gerard's Western Flag, which is a software-based artwork that digitally reimagines the Lucas Gusher in Spindletop, Texas, which is the site of the world's first major oil find in 1901, um, but as a flagpole waving a flag made of black smoke in an isolated landscape. Um, so we actually don't own this piece, but recently installed it in 2018 in, in Truth. 
So although some of these artworks uh, might date back to the middle of the 20th century, um, the DMA actually only began collecting them in 1998. So the first time-based media acquisition here was a 1996 video work by Rosemary Trockel titled, for example, Balthazar, Age Six. Um, and as technologies have advanced over time, and in these last two decades of collecting, um, while we've been collecting, artists have also been able to create artworks that are even larger and more complicated. So this recent acquisition, uh, Rubber Pencil Devil by Alex de Corte, was up until just recently in our Four Dreamer of Houses exhibition. Um, it includes hundreds of components, um, including a painted aluminum house frame, over 200 neon tubes, a 15 monitor video wall, and, nearly, and a nearly three hour long video that plays in the back of the house. Um, so this piece took our team almost a year to plan for and then a full five weeks to install um, for the exhibition uh, in the back of the barrel, barrel vault. So um, going back to Tanaka, um, whenever a curator decides they want to show a work from this part of the collection, um, our team prepares by first doing examination and research behind the scenes. So. Lance and I were really excited when we heard this was on the checklist for um, Slip Zone um, because we've known for a little while that this piece was in need of some conservation treatment. Um, and the exhibition gave us a really wonderful opportunity um, to take care of this treatment and also learn a little bit more about the work itself. So here are uh, just all of the physical components laid out on the table in the objects lab before the exhibition. Um, so on the left, you have the wires and the bells, and on the right, you have the motor and the push button switch. Um, so our first step was historical research. Um, uh, Tanaka passed away in 2005, and we acquired this piece seven years later in 2012. Um, so unfortunately, we did not have the opportunity to speak with her directly about it, um, which we always try and do wherever possible. Um, but from historical research and connections with those who are still tied to her representatives and her estate, um, we do know a, a good amount of information about its display. So the physical appearance of this artwork is not defined, um, nor has it been constant through time. Um, so we know that many of the elements have actually changed since 1955, and Tanaka was involved in these changes. Um, so on this side, you can see that uh, the bell diagram from 1956 looks different than the bells that are installed with the work today. The aesthetics are slightly different. Um, and then on the right, the motor that was first used by Tanaka was also much different than the motor that we use today, too. Um, so we tried to find out as much as we could on how these decisions to change elements were actually made. Um, for example, was it related to aesthetics? Was it related to technological changes over time? Um, because this information informs our conservation decisions as well. We also know that um, the wires have changed in both appearance and length. So today the wires that are installed on the piece are the gray speaker wires on the top image. Um, but there was actually, when we acquired the piece, there was also an older set of wires that came with it in the crate. Um, you can see them on the left on the bottom right here. Um, and they were a much different style and also a different color. Um, and we know through previous installation images from before we own the work that the bells have sometimes been installed along the wall and also sometimes been installed in the middle of the room. So with any work that can be installed like this one in a multitude of ways, the input of the artist is really, really important. Um, and when we don't have that, uh, we do the best that we can to just adhere to what we believe their original intentions would have been. So because we know that Tanaka was involved in the replacement of the parts that we have today, we want to preserve them for as long as we possibly can. Um, and we all know that this can be difficult with certain technologies. I mean, we all replace things like our cell phones and our computers every few years. Um, and just like, uh, just like how these things have a limited shelf life, there are certain electronic components of artworks have a limited shelf life as well. Um, so we do what we can to plan for that, and and when certain components might reach a point of obsolescence, you know, what what do we do? Um, 
So it was really wonderful to work with Vivian on this project because she was able to connect with a colleague who's actually still connected to Tanaka's estate. Um, and she helped us determine equipment specs for some of the components. So we were able to find and purchase actually 20 additional bells. Um, and we're also hoping to track down an additional motor in the near future as well. So these components will stay in storage until the time comes when we might need them for repair or replacement. Uh, we also purchased 10 new buttons. Um, because this part of the artwork is meant to be pushed by visitors, it obviously gets some wear and tear. Um, and it was starting to show this with a recent installation. So you can see on the left, the threading between the top and the bottom half was actually broken before this exhibition. Um, the two halves weren't sitting securely together, which is definitely problematic for, an, for a part of the artwork that still needs to be touched. Um, so we've been trying actually for the last couple years to find a replacement for this element um, and Vivian's connections enabled us to do so. So although the replacement, which is um, the image in the middle, um, is not a perfect match, we know that it's the closest one that it exists to like today and that's available. Um, and the old one will now just be kept in storage for research purposes only. So we will never get rid of anything like this. This will stay with the object you know, for the rest of its life, but it just won't be used again. Um, so we also did a little bit of minor treatment on the wire ends. Um, so the motor has a screw style terminal block with twist on wire connectors, which means that each time the wires are installed, the ends get chewed up a little bit and they need to be cut down a few centimeters with each iteration. Um, so this year we soldered the wire ends so they'll connect more smoothly to the terminal block and we can actually now install them a few times without causing damage to the wires. So this also increases the life of the artwork. Um, and there are a lot of challenges involved with preserving works that involve new technologies. And while interventive and preventive conservation is helpful in extending the lives of these works as long as we can, the other really big tool we have that, that our team uses a lot um, is just documentation. We do a lot of documentation. Um, and whenever we work on or install a piece from our time-based media collection, we try to add as much as we can to our files. Um, and our work on Tanaka this year was no different. So generally for media works, there are two different times in its lifetime where we you know, try and really take in as much information as possible. And the first is when it comes into the collection, when it's acquired, and the second is each time it's installed. So. Now I'm going to turn it over to uh, Lance, who um, has been here for 17 years with the DMA and installed this piece quite a few times. Um, and he's going to show you just a few different iterations of this work and also talk about how our team handles install and documentation. Yeah, I'm going to show uh, some different examples of different iterations of other works of art. Uh, I've installed, I think the Tanaka Bells I've installed about six times that I can think of. This is the current installation in the Stoffel quad. And the uh, image on the right is at the Rachowski warehouse. And uh, you see how it's two completely different installations. You have the, we found uh, documentation where Tanaka had built a pedestal for one of the iterations. And we mimicked and used the same dimensions to build that same pedestal that we're using and the button is mounted on the top and the motor is hidden. But at the warehouse, the motor is on the floor and the button is just attached to the wall. Uh, here's that same piece. This is at the Guggenheim. It's hard to see, but the bells are, there were scattered along the level two, the second level. Here's a close up from the same Guggenheim installation. And each time I've installed this piece, it's been completely different. I don't, I don't think I've ever done it the same twice. And the last two times I installed it, we installed it and walked away, and then it was decided that it needed to be redone, reconfigured, so we had to redo the whole thing. And this is uh, the Phil Collins three-channel video, The World Won't Listen. Um, this is a three-channel synchronized video that we did in 2007. And uh, this is a d another iteration of it. It's just shown as a single channel. This was done in 2018. Was it? Yeah. 2018 is a part of the Truth exhibition. Um, when 
we had trouble contacting Phil to, to get permission to do it as just a single channel, uh, but he finally heard that we were trying to reach him, and he reached out to us, and he was very excited about it. And then he asked me if I was going to show the the standard definition, which this is this version, or the high definition version that he had just recently remade. Uh, we didn't have the space to show the wide screen version, and we didn't even know it existed. So that's a complete different iteration. It shows that uh, artists can continue working on a work of art after we purchase it. Here's another iteration of uh, Arthur Jaffa's Love is the Message, the me message is death. This is also in part of the truth installation. And then next to it is the same video shown as it's streamed off our website. And then here is a, uh, a report, an iteration report. And basically we just go through and we write down and take measurements and just meticulously document everything. Uh, so people can go back and see how it was done uh, and try to mimic that installation. Or for when we're not here, when, when other people take over our jobs, that they know how to do some of these complex installations. This is sort of, every, Elena wrote down everything that uh, we include in the iteration reports, public feedback, lots of documentation physical components, modifications, maintenance during the exhibition. They all require, ma all these require maintenance, ongoing maintenance. And here is our current installation in the barrel vault in the Stoffel Quad. Um, it's on view till next summer. Yeah. Should all go see it, press the button and hold it, hold it down, it'll keep ringing the sequence. And I believe that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions? Yes. Um, so, oh, I have to repeat the question. The question was, how do you um, keep tension in the strand while the adhesive is setting? So um, there's a couple. We actually set the adhesive with hot air or a hot needle, so it actually sets really quickly, actually. Um, but the weave itself, um, the fun thing about the adhesives that we use is that they're super easily reversible, so you can actually, like, attach one part and then pull from the other side so you can actually like keep kind of um, putting water on it, lifting it up, pulling. So you can kind of do a back and forth. Um, but it's all about the adhesive and all about the hot air or hot needle or whatever setting it. Mm-hmm. Specific. The question is, um, how did we get into conservation? I, I'll let Elena. She has a very interesting path into conservation. <laughs> I think everybody does. Um, so uh, the great thing about conservation is that it's a really interdisciplinary field. So there's a lot of people that come from many different backgrounds that I think makes it like that much more fun to you know chat with colleagues and and you know, so, uh, the, the main things that you need um, before you go to graduate school are um, uh, strong foundations in art, art history, and chemistry. And so within that, I mean, I, I have come from, my undergraduate major was interdisciplinary neuroscience, and I only picked that because I liked science and wanted to take as many as I could, and that was the one way to do it. And then I took a bunch of studio classes afterwards. Laura has come from, Laura's a painter also, and has come from a studio background where, you know, so I think that um, there's no way to, to have, to, to do it all, and, and that's the great thing about, you know, yeah. preparing for school too, but yeah. Um, 
I don't know if you want to add anything to that too. Yeah, and you, I mean, you kind of build your path because there's only four graduate programs in the United, or three graduate programs in the United States. So if you're interested, if you go on on their website, so there's the University of Delaware, NYU, and Buffalo State. They have a lot of information about the pre um, the curriculum that you need for getting into graduate school. Um, and, um, but also just build your, your hand in studio arts, art history, chemistry, um, and see what you're interested in, but there's no wrong way to get into it. Um, and there's a lot of, especially now a lot of guidance online of how to get into, into the field. Yeah. Any other questions? I think we're all like trying to beat the storm. Um, but thank you so much for coming. If there's no other questions, thank you so much. <laughs>